G'day everyone, this is the Big Bash version of the Melbourne Pro Punters panel on racetrack Ralphie Horowitz. We've decided to young down a little bit and we've got Alfred Jump. G'day Alfred. Say good day Ralph, he's the new watermelon boy. <laughs> this is Darren Potter and this is Anthony Jump. This is the Big Bash edition. Um, Pots, how's the week been? We've been all four city tracks. I've just been betting on the Big Bash, Ralphie. That's it. Jumpy, five country meetings for you? Yes, been everywhere. And I've seen them shit. Anyway, that's all the time we've got for because it's a Big Bash edition. We've got a short attention span. Back to you in the studio. <laughs> well, we're back here with a couple of empty vessels. Uh, Racetrack Ralphie and uh, oh, Jared Potter. Your second one? Uh, we'll get to the book. That was my skinny one. Because apparently, every you got a big bash everything. Todd Baker and Adam Blinko said everything's a big bash now. Somebody in the six. Um, well, how do, we, how do we big bash racing? How would you big bash racing? I don't know how you do it. It might take a little bit of logistics, but I want to see a race every ten minutes. I want to be out in an hour and a half. <laughs> Could I assure you that there'll be people getting paid a lot of money in racing? We were very good at doing PowerPoint presentations. Not much good at much else. Who'd be the moment of pitching that very good item? This is what racing needs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, it's, it's been a solid it's, It has. Look, I've been, to, I've been to, I went to Yarra Valley last Thursday. I went to Echuca on New Year's Eve. I went to Hanging Rock on New Year's Day. And I went to the Televised Woolamai meeting on Monday. With Alfred? No, Alfred was working, so. Uh, Alfred just potted around betting on the Big Bash because that's what he does. <laughs> Hello to all the Big Bash punters out there too, there's a heap of them. And uh, as Snowy's been saying, it's uh, racing is the great game. But as our friend Osbed said, the Big Bash is the great, great game. Right. Um, what, what's been the average trade of the man on a Big Bash game, Jumpy? Well, just on the fair, it's normally... On the fair. I don't know, probably 40 million. I'm not normally out that late, I'm normally out by then, but it's, it's a stack of money. And then you've got what the corporates are holding, and like, I haven't been doing as much on the fair. I've been, I've been doing, to be perfectly honest, I've been doing a lot of it with the corporates, and just bringing up and, um, and doing it there. But that's more to do with my precarious financial position than anything else. So if, so if you're very good at punting, yep. let's say from the yep. is, is the big bash shangri for because of the quick movements? It's, it's got two things. It's got rapid basis, basis movements based on what's happening in the game, and it's also got just bulk liquidity, and it's on at a perfect time. So it's on when, especially, like, let's face it, we've got another TV here in front of us that the camera can't see, and uh, what's on up there? Is that Hogan's Heroes Hogan's or Dad's Heroes? Armour? Dad's yeah. Army. Hogan's Heroes. Right, it's Hogan's Heroes. So basically our summer television is essentially filled with that sort of stuff, or the Big Bash. I know about them. I love everybody racing. <laughs> so, um, racing's still done a good job. They've played to the crowds. Like there's been good crowds at all the meetings that I've been to. So you've been, the, so you've been Yarra Valley. Yeah, where the big storm hit, but there was still yeah, yeah. there was still a heap of people there yeah. on probably one of the most disgusting days weather-wise I've ever yeah. experienced. Um, Achuca. Achuca, big holiday crowd up there. Um, friend of the show, Bobby O'Kane, he came along. Um, I was up there, there was a, a, a decent crowd up there, considering the time of year. Hang Rock is always popular. When I went up there, there was plenty of people kick around there. I've spoken to people that went to Mornington, Burrumby and Tarang. They all had reasonable meetings, and I even spoke to one bookie who worked at Flemington, who was in the inside where it started, because apparently in Melbourne it started raining gently after the first or something, and he was in the lawn undercroft and had a busy day under there. So. They managed even to get a few people at Flemington, which so, is so for those of us, yeah. Yeah, so for those of us who just uh, treat racing as an obstacle issue, which is probably the majority of people taking it seriously, what's what's the uh, what's the vibe? Because you've uh, as far as ten years go, the health of racing from an obstacle perspective during the summer holiday period. It, it's still it's still when the clubs are making money, but the thing is they haven't helped themselves over. Um, the last little one. This is why the picnics are so healthy. It's 10 bucks to get in. You can bring your own food. You can bring your own drink within reason. It's six races, so it's a short car. You're not there all day. So, especially a joint like Woolamai, it, like the weather wasn't flush there on Monday. But if you've got a day like today at Woolamai, they can go to the beach for a couple of hours. The first race is in sort of 2, 2.30. And then they can be back wherever they need to be for tea. So, um, they just they catered for that well. But like, went to Hanging Rock. There were still heaps of people there, but 
It was $25 to get in, and you were searched to make sure you weren't bringing anything of your own in. What's the job? What, 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 what would you say the rough percentage of smart you know, people have done from? Yeah, all types of smart people. People have done from genuinely yeah. to yeah. get the race book. What percentage of dollar wise, not people, but dollar wise, do you think spent? Compared to the complete recreational punish. Percentage dollar wise in the overall market or at the smaller meetings? Yeah. In, in those markets we've been talking about. Oh, it'd be overwhelming, it'd be, I'd say it'd be in between 85 to 90% recreational money. Which is bookie shangri Yeah. And, it, and, and you can lay the stuff out of the market that you can't lay in town. The people who are just there for a day out and have a bet, they don't want to have $5 on a 6 to 4 chance to win $12.50. They want to have two and a half each way and a twelve dollar shot to try and get something out of it. So There's also people, particularly Yarra Valley, which would be a fairly yep. moneyed area in, in pockets, yep. uh, where that same recreational money that someone wants to have five hundred each way. And probably more so at a meeting like that, there was a lot of owners' money there. There was plenty of owners that were prepared to. Like I took, I think we had two thousand dollar bets. And they were just owners that were there and wanted to back their own horse. And, and most of the blokes I work for, whenever you see, if as long as it's a cash bet like that off the ground and you sort of you know that it's not like most of them are more than happy to take the bet. So that Yarra Valley Jumping, how many bookies? Uh, they moved us inside, so there were seven. Because they, they initially, and I spoke to Brett Shandrook, and Happy New Year, Brett. Uh, Who is? The CEO there at Yarra Valley. Um, he actually has listened to both the bookies and I think to some of his customers. Okay. They actually tried to put the bookies in little individual marquees out on the front lawn. Yeah. What a novel idea, putting the bookies where the people are. So, but once he realised the weather forecast, he thought with the, just with like having computers and all that sort of stuff, you don't sort of want that equipment outside. So, um, yeah. so he moved us inside and they put a couple more bookies in, but it was still a reasonable yeah. meeting. So, are they, what a, what I'm interested in, yep. are the on-course bookies jumping just following the vault or, and Betfair or are they sort of, is it a different market almost? Yeah. Yeah. No, they're sort of... Are the bookies doing form? The bookies are definitely doing form. There's, there's, there's some form bookies and then there are guys so that are just there to trade. But also, you can get... The difference is that the bookies now, especially with the vault, um, for those that don't know, if something, especially if something at the shorter end of the market, um, if the bookies haven't laid it, they will push and they will go at least the bet fair price to try and get it in. And if you are keen to back things shorter in the market, yeah. I'd say the vast majority of the time you're going to do better on course. Yeah, well, the, the reason I'm asking is that the um, some of the big teams, yep. the combination of the big teams and the algorithm, yep. which is just the, all the corporate bookmakers adjusting their market without taking a bet. If one of them moves, the rest follow it. They don't yes. necessarily have to have taken a bet. Um, it's playing havoc, particularly at these secondary meetings. Oh yeah. And I would think if you're working on course, you'd have to be aware of that. And, like to me, that VOP market yep. is way too reactionary. At yes. The moment. Well, you can see that by the amount of fluctuations. It's, it's bouncing around yep. too far. Like it's. So where's the opportunity? Yeah. Well, if you can get ahead of where the uh, big teams are going, so first of all, if you can identify the ones that are likely to target and back them early, and then try and back the other um, chances in the race, later, yeah. later, you know, you can really work the percentage in your favour because it's, um, it's dramatic. I'll just give everyone an example. There's a race that um, we're a bit today. I was about to send it out in my cross placing, so Astrolab was 440. I thought the, the big teams are going to target this all, so we'll send it out now to back it now. And unfortunately, I was too slow. And by the time I went to hit the send button, one of the big teams had taken it and I moved the price of the top sport from 440 to 290. They did back it at all of them, so it was a proper bet. It wasn't just one. Yeah, of the it, wasn't, it wasn't the algorithm. It was. And they adjusted the market from 440 to 290 in one hit. Yes. Which then it wasn't. There was no value in me sending it out. But something happened with Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah, 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 what did you explain? So if, uh, if, if people who do their own assistance like yep. we, we think there's an over, and it goes from 40 to 90 like Astrolab. So obviously where we, by the time you're watching this, you'll know if Astrolab's one or not. If Astrolab gets out back out to 450, it won't be winning. 
No, well, <laughs> the reason <laughs> it'll, it'll, if, so that's before race one, right? If it turn, it's not a natural on pace horse, and it's drawn wide, right? So if it turns out that it's a, a savage on pace bias, yeah. it'll probably start six dollars. Yes, I mean, yeah. you know what I mean. So that they're the reasons why these things can, can, can happen. But four forty to three dollars is probably too big a short for that horse. Yeah. It's funny, which is just to come back to the point where you were speaking about the secondary meeting. Then, boss, it was a classic secondary meeting case at Bullamai on uh, Monday because we had a clash of two different dimensions. We had all the picnic bookmakers who, to be fair to them, I would say, I think there was about 10 bookies there. I reckon seven of them didn't know that it was a tab meeting. Right. And didn't know that the fair and the corporates were operating on it. So- Do they know it's a year starting with two? <laughs> they didn't know that, but they, they there was a couple of times there, and it was very amusing that the old bookies put up 180 to begin, which is not, outside of the realms of what happens at the picnics. They will go up at a big percentage like that. But then there was the couple that were actually looking at what the corporates were doing, and literally in the space of about 35 seconds, we went from 180% to 140, and just straight down, and then from there they worked their way down. But the other thing that made it a little bit easier for the bookmakers was that early doors is, and you see this especially at the secondary Sunday meetings, and sometimes you see at the provincial meetings on a Saturday here in Victoria, there's no liquidity in Betfair until about the last four or five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it's almost the next race to jump, and then the traders chime in and, and start doing their thing. So yeah. it was interesting down there. So I said about recreational punters, were there any knuckleheads there? Uh, no, everyone was reasonably well behaved. There was no buffoonery. <laughs> Could have been, a, been accused of being something very stuff. I'm not sure what the exact term was around here. Well, look, uh, my favourite journalist is Michael Lewis, who I think it's it's Bastion. And he said there were knucklehead punters in one of the homes this week. No, well, the sprinkler's thrown away, thrown in the bin. The sprinkler's thrown in the bin. I hope he's not talking about me. And, and I read that, and I read that. Numbskull. Numbskull. Oh, what am I a numbskull? I'm reading this, but at the time I was pressing some pants, I was going for lunch, and then the phone rang, and I went to answer the phone, instead I picked up the oh, line, yeah. and I answered the <laughs> and then my son was playing up, so teaching my lesson, I went to stick two fingers in his eyes, and I went, and he did that, oh, fucking me, I'm a numbskull. So, oh, um, so does that mean... Um, yeah, in face the world. Let's let's face it. Over the course of uh, the old show up there in Sydney, we uh, Mark Lambert gave quite a few pearls away, didn't he? Yes. Has he been an advocate of turning the sprinklers on? I think so. Yeah. He, he's got a bit of an idea about the game. Roll me on fire, but Jeffy, that's a really interesting part of the discussion, right? Because I think yeah. Matt is really referring to some of those Sydney analysts yeah. that are saying that you know. The watering of the tracks create real problems in Sydney. Yeah. Uh, and the, the reason is, is because it rains. Uh, Rob Bordas is obviously one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Is that where he got it from? Because it wasn't Rob yeah. Bordas on the show. Yeah. I didn't. He was on the radio with you. Yeah. Right. Maybe that's what really. It's yeah. probably referring to Rob. So anyway, um, I don't, I don't know why you'd call Rob Bordas on that show, but <laughs> I think the point, the point is that it's a very different conversation in Sydney than it is in Melbourne because it, it just rains more in Sydney. And the rains, the rains in, in more volume. So if, if, you've got, if, you're, if the tracks are watered in Sydney, and then you get these large volumes of rain, the, on top of the overwatering, it creates real problems. So it makes it very hard for the tracks to dry out. Whereas in Melbourne, they have to be irrigated because there just isn't the volume of rain here, really, to, to not irrigate them. So, the, so given that Matt's a journalist in Melbourne, I would say Matt stick to the debate over the Melbourne tracks. And what we're asking for, so us, if you're, if we're in the numbskull group that you're referring to, you, you'd like to clarify that because you, you, Matt tends to not use names, which I find a bit, you know, where I'm using your name, Matt. So if you're referring to us, please use the name. Um, what we're asking for is not for the sprinklers to be thrown out, absolutely not. What we're asking for is that we recognise that we've got a fantastic group of track managers and we allow them to do their job as they see fit and not apply undue pressure to them yeah. by trainers with vested interests with certain horses to overwater those tracks. That's what we're asking for. So the debate is about you know, whether 
pressure should be applied to the track managers to irrigate to a certain level, or whether it, they're just allowed to use their judgment and decide what is appropriate for their track. And we're not that's what the debate's about. We've had a fair crack on this topic, we're not going to get bogged down, but one very important point is Tuppy mentioned Melbourne and Yarra yeah. Valley, yeah. and the big storm hit Melbourne, and what were the four different ratings you found out about the different tracks? That storm the four metro tracks when the storm hit? So I think it was 18 mils at Flemington, 32 mils at Mooney Valley, 38 at Sandown, 81 at Caulfield. So between 18 and 31 mils on a Thursday hit Mooney Valley and Flemington. Flemington uh, Mooney Valley race Saturday, Flemington race Sunday. <laughs> Both tracks race perfectly <laughs> after getting all that rain. <laughs> Let me assure you, punters, the cause and effect is having expert curators with uh, well trained tracks who, are, who don't overwater during the year means that when it pisses down two days before a race meeting and you get half the track at least into the two days, you get an opportunity to race perfectly. Because Mooney Valley race like concrete. Yeah, good concrete. That's a the only point I want to make there, if Robbie's a numbskull, where do I sign up? <laughs> oh, numbskulls as well. And, and so this, this brings me in, another point I want to talk about this. Um, almost singularly the biggest change in my life. On my outlook on racing and yeah. form, I should say. <coughs> was finding out that Rob Waterhouse and Dominic Byrne oh, oh, barely the yeah. vision. And that comes from their own mouth. So they, their belief is that figures are what where you can make much more money than this. Our stewards need to work with the times. And I've had a crap for meetings at the Christmas New Year. Of course, we're about to make yesterday in Sandown on the Wednesday, so it's, uh, if you want to say talk to me, talk to me, well and good. Um, I'll be explaining why I'm trying to do it. Invicta and Domino is a starting point. It led and handed up after going at a walk. They went 10 lengths slower than when it won same track, same distance. So you can have all your theories that you believe in or don't believe in, or all methods of measuring that you believe in and don't believe in, but this is same track, same distance after that. That apprentice, Jack Martin, should have been sent to apprentice school to say how bad a ride that was in doing that. Now, a couple of things. Todd Bright, the likes of course, has been this much. A few days later, I get some tweets from people who listen to David Hayes being interviewed who said that the kid went too slow on it and they said, yep. Hayes, he said the same thing. Then Vince's figures come out, same track, same distance, he went 10 lengths slower to the 800. There's no mention of the stewards report. You know, on exactly the same day, the 24th of uh, December, and we're never personal, but we get our facts right. Mark Zara gets fined for slightly easing up on the morning effort in a winning Ride. Not just a winning ride, a tactically brilliant ride, because if he had it gone back like a previous it would have lost. I don't care what anyone says, it would have lost. If he had it gone back like a <laughs> so he just put it there, yeah. they walked, and he just dashed past him, and then he had the race one half of these up and had to get it going, and it wins. A bit of hard fighters, but ultimately, his tactical brilliance early won the race. Muck up a little bit late, but it didn't cost him a win. He had an apprentice jockey, and we're not being overly critical of the kids, and it's your own fault for that kids. You got okay, no, I wore that but he should have been, the, the ride should have been questioned, and he should have been sent to a print school for why. Yet nothing gets done, yet a bloke who's tactical brilliance wins a race, gets fined. Something's fucking wrong with him. Yeah, well, I'm going to have to take issue with someone that Ralph, right? Oh, yeah. The, the bit I'm going to take issue is you say, you're saying Jack Martin needs to be sent back to a print school. Yes. I'm saying, where did he learn to ride like that? <laughs> no. Jack Martin, that got me. Jack Jim Martin, Martin. Jack Martin didn't. Do that. He, that, that must be ingrained in him. He must have been coached that the yes. way to win on leaders is to slow down, yes. to like, try and pinch a couple of sectionals, all that. And he had what he hasn't been trained to do is to look at the form of his horse, understand that, that horse went, you know, at a high cruising speed throughout its previous start, and that his way to win that race was to run at a speed that was going to make it the other horses have to chase him. So if he gets sent back to apprentice school, I'll probably pat him on the back. So I think we need to we, not, we, we need to say to Jack, it's okay Jack, we didn't talk to you about that, but that's not, it's not really your fault. We need to go to the guys at the apprentice school that are running it and ask them, is this how they're teaching these young boys, practically? Right? So I'm saying that the apprentice school has done a fantastic job. Yes, but they've, they've produced a really good crop of young kids, so that you've got to give some credit that they've done some, some good work about you know bringing them on and 
creating an environment where those kids can come through the system and do well. But I think there's there's probably something missing in that apprentice school to do with tactics. Yes. And this uh, phenomena, like, oh, it's, a, it's an epidemic in Victoria, of teaching young jockeys, and jockeys in general, to slow down in the middle of races. Well, I heard an old fellow, he won a race for Orchard, I reckon. And he said, clearly Noel's his own man. Like Hello, it. King. You don't like anyone like that as a starting point. And he just said, well, let's face it, in Victoria, there's all these sheep, and they all try and get to the front and then go bar bar and jump as possible. He said, I don't like that. So, which is great, isn't it? And now he's, he's known as a single human for a reason. Just better and different. And uh, yeah, it's a great point you make. And it has to be trained them. Because when you think about it, who are the ones that normally get sent to the French school? The ones who go too fast to avoid them. You cannot I assure anyone. Or something else, you're a better chance of being able to fall in or win going yeah, too, fast too fast to break an heart. than being out of that with a negative and super right. Speaking of which, all the way for you, Jumpy and Alfred, won't do uh, to, uh, to uh, let you go. But we're watching, you know, watching the business. I'm having lunch and pick up on the TV and uh, something. Is it the good oil? I, I think that's the show before, yeah. The, the Black Booker's type segment. Yep. And I'm saying, look at this. Horse after horse after horse. Guess what? where they were when they get highlighted. Out the back, back. there it is, work home. They're all exactly the same. And you think, does it look like, and, and as you, you made a point of view, you made a point of view, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And we did give Warren a pass because Warren's what? Warren identified a few on paces there, but the rest of the team there were very keen on back markers. What would you identify on paces on summer tracks? Well, what could be the upside? Yeah, did you notice Chris Waller? I've said this out on Twitter that the leading of the estate, God bless all the Royal Road. And no, not to you because you were of course on the run up for you. No, me and my punters, we just went, this, I have to get this off my chest. Yeah, we went skullduggery into Diamond Baroness, into Rich Luck. All backed at between seven and nine dollars. All started at about five dollars, and all got beaten. You had a top one cat, don't you? No, just a cat with one dollar. Oh well. Yeah. The encouraging thing is, punters, we found some nice, strong bets at good prices. Oh, we just didn't quite get the You're results. You're in the game, as Mark Lane um, But but Chris Waller's stats over six weeks in Melbourne: the zero from 23, 13 of them were in the market, yet only two of those 13 yeah. were in the leading duo at the 600. Yes, well, I, I can tell you now, I'd, I'd sort of, I'd, I'd, I'd um, worked around the number of Chris Waller runners yesterday yep. on purpose because of, of that, that the period that had been not going so well. And when it, when I saw prior to race one yesterday that he was in Melbourne, I thought, that's interesting. Yes. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there are some changes at the Waller stable because. Um, Oh, I've got a just a follow up out of that. I think he was in Melbourne because he's. Um, if you want some more stats, there were some interesting stats coming from the both the random and compulsory drug testing that he did on his stable staff. There was five that tested positive, but none to. Um, ice. And here's a big tip, punters: stay off ice. <laughs> That's that's a New Year's resolution to begin with. Do you watch Breaking Bad? Yes, all stay off it. Oh, all of it, and twice. Do you watch Breaking Bad? No, this is the best show ever. You, and, and, and I don't know about you, Chubby, but it took me a while to get into it. Yeah. Because I hated every single character in it. <laughs> I had no empathy for any of them. But I'm rest assured it's the best written to say at all. And the final episode is singly the final scene in the final episode is probably the greatest piece of television ever uh, but so it wouldn't be a long list of people who said look i was struggling in life things weren't going my way just, uh, this has left me i couldn't get a job but then fortunately i started taking drugs <laughs> and it all turned around never look back wouldn't be a long list of those people so, so what happened with the drug testing um well it's funny this statistical information comes courtesy of the Paradise and Titus O'Reilly for Idea, oh, yeah. because they they were talking about that on their final pot of the year, because they did they of course did it in a satirical manner when they looked at. Can we rely on these numbers? Well, they said there was there was no one actually tested positive to ice, but they did find five um, five employees and tested positive or something. Uh, 
one was sacked, three of them left, and another decided to get out before it was good. So I think that's why he was in Melbourne. I think he's put in a whole heap of new processes. You were and he was handy. And none of them were on cobalt. Isn't that interesting that? Now, I spent two years full-time as a kid getting the same uh, um, I would say, back then, they drug tested employees. Yeah. I would say... Oh, you can't. You're going to the bank up. That's my thing. Yeah. And, um, but it was, it was, and the, the question that is, if you... I'm going to say it's a fairly low socio-economic starting point yeah. because in reality you don't want a staff who's paying less to pick up horses. Yeah. Yep. And then you get some unbelievable horsemen who are prepared to horse people. Yep. Yeah. Prepared to work not much. But Hello to the women as leading strapper. That's it. Um, but, but yeah, so I reckon that would be a big uh, challenge for some for the big players like Chris Waller who's a switch on businessman, yeah. genius trainer everything. The reality is you need to have some staff who's prepared to do them any more. Yeah. And the other thing back on the apprentice school, yeah, there's no doubt at the moment at the top end we've got some very, very, very talented apprentices. apprentices. Luckily, most of them are riding in town at the minute. We've got like, well, oh, Reggie Bayless, has he just come out of his time? Yes. But we've still got um, Bo Mertens, Benny Allen, Ben Thompson, Ben Thompson, all these boys, all great jockeys. However, over the last week or so, I've been exposed to the ones that are maybe not quite at the top of the class. And I'm telling you now, we've got a problem. Because the depth in the Victorian jockey ranks at the minute is the, at the not necessarily at the top end, but which is where you guys generally deal. But when you come down to the to the sort of lower ends, like it just makes life so much harder. Because it's in, in when we were doing the form painting rock, it was almost as much handicapping whether the jockey could get a horse around that tight track as it was to what the horse was forming but yeah, that, 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 That's a good point that Jumpy makes too, because when he's talking about that, he's talking about like picnic type meetings or, you know, may, tabs, maybe yeah. a tap, whatever. Yeah. And you've got the good riders, the good apprentice yeah. we're talking about, riding at Flemington and yeah. Warfield, where it's, you know, like, you still got to be a good jockey, but it's not. The, the, the tracks Jumpy's talking about, you have to be a very skillful rider to get, them to get the horses yeah. around those courses. They're not camber, they're, they're turned, yeah. they're sharp, they're ups and downs, they're all over the place. So the, the, the rider on those out wide tracks is almost as important as the horse. Yeah. You know? Have you ever tried to play seriously in that wide case? <laughs> no, no, I haven't. Well, that's why I reckon. I've been doing it for No, it's obviously. Yeah, and then. Yeah, as well. I was going to say, I thought, oh, the Holly Powell, Sandy Creek said. <laughs> Never. <Yeah. laughs> yeah. That's my but, um, but yeah, I just thought, gee, man, it's just uh, such a different skill set. Yeah. Because you're trying to pick, not pick the best, you're trying to pick the worst, worst. Yeah. And and also the other thing is, even if there are some good jockeys here, bad jockeys can make good jockeys look bad, mate. Putting them in the wrong spot or being a bit dangerous. I, I did one race at Stony Creek, and the two horses I back ran five minutes below their four. <laughs> so I'm not sure if that's because of the. It's a steep track. The, the track or what. what what, what the vagaries are, but never again for me. Stony Creek is on the hard list for me. Too hard. No, it's um, it is something that, especially, the the common thing that most of those um sort of out wide means or the lower grade means are they're normally on tight tracks. Like all the picnic circuits, all the picnic circuit race on tight tracks. Um, and then when you think of some of the out wide ones, it's only like there's some that you know that you like better on like a joint like Hamilton. Terrain, like everyone likes betting on those because they're big, beautiful straights. And even though you, your luck can sort of even out because you know you're going to get out at some stage. But like, if you weren't on the bunny there, and, like they ran a mile race and they start the straight and go down past the the post again, just about to yeah. rock. Yeah. Like it's just, and it's reverse cambered. So unless you're leading or up near the pace, like you can't ride them cold and run off. Yeah, of course, Jumpy told me I I just watched Grace Goodwin at Bullamore. Yep. No, I was just watching the races. He was worth probably four lengths. Yeah. Just getting around the corners, saving ground. Yeah, and you know, knowing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a tactic that we used, Pods, when we looked at the Corinthian there when they ran that picnic race at Cranbourne. And it's like the difference in those jockeys, just wow. ability wise, is like, and it's no knock on the others, like they're just there trying to do their best. But it was the same at Hand Rock. How far is the length? Two and a half, two minutes? Yeah, you say two and a half metres, something like that. Yeah, to see what you, when you said that. So let's say, what you want? Well, how long is a horse? Well, 
was. <laughs> no, I can't remember. I've got it written down somewhere. Let's get that. Let's say, let's say, let's say let's do it up. what you're basically saying is not a big statement. Uh, it is not a, do you say the, the, the job is four lengths? To your head, you think the four length width, that's yeah. a lot. But if you think of 10 metres over the course of a mile race, that's not much, isn't it? Yeah, bits and pieces. No, 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 absolutely, it's not. So it makes perfect sense. That's what racing's all about. It is a game of fractions, you know. Yes. Which is when it gets amusing when the TV commentators are all up once and back in the horse and follow segment. When a gap comes at the 200 metre mark, yeah. and they go, oh, oh the horse had plenty of time. What they're not taking into account is speed, momentum, and, and well, losing position. So, like, this is fine for the punters to think about, because, you know. Um, the average race in town, just say 10 to 12 starters, yeah. over between 12 and 1600 metres, the usual, the average margin from first to last is about eight lengths. Yeah. Like, like, so when you think about a 1200 metre race, it's not, what, what you're dealing with is eight lengths, really. Yeah. Yeah. And where the horses fit on that eight length the grid, yeah. grid, you know. And by extension, when we, when we uh, you know, take the piss out of getting back in cover and all that, oh. cover and all that what you're saying is, so often, when they think it's good strategy to then get covered. No. Say, well, here we go. Two hundred meters. You can have you can have eight meters. You can have ten, twenty meters on this. Yeah. So effectively, you're giving and everyone weight with a handicap. That's eight meters. So a good example. I said it yesterday. Gruasi, who had been racing on pace, was dragged back to last from a wide draw. He gave away about three to four lengths on a grid that was, you know. We'll make one more point then we come back to the answer. Because it's from that race. So yes, the change of tactics comes out 20 minutes before the Oak Doors race. Yep. Horse called Hot Seat, it's a fast horse. It's not much good, but it's a fast horse. It's got early speed. When you did that form, if any of us did it properly, you look at Boxing Day, they went fast. It's 12 to 400. Now, Mitch Aiken, Five winners in the previous two weeks, so the kid had his confidence up. He's yep. a three kilo kid, big strong horse, could he hold it if they took on each other racing? And 20 minutes before, 20 to 1 shot, hot seat, the only horse that had the speed to compete with Oak Door. Change the tactics in there. The stewards have to be able to learn to read races and read market methods because then the 20 to 1 shot. You said it's not going to yeah, lead. Really Once you go back with cover, you're so naturally fast that actually yeah. tough in front. Strain to let Oak Door lead, and then Potts' horse, Grossi, who does have the only other horse with any speed in that race, out the back. Now, once that announcement was made, what you get there is quite interesting. Because what the market said, you know, you're having a data room, but we just don't really know if it still exists since uh, Dale Brown's boss is on uh, Gremlin's coverage. What we saw was it a dollar ninety into a dollar eighty in no time on the fair and across the board, and then when it hit the line and won after a very soft, uncontested lead where the horse relaxed beautifully because it had such an uncontested soft lead, it was a dollar seventy across all the touch, which, as we know, most of us know, the big punters can only really get on a couple of spots, and that's one of them. So, in other words, by extension, once it became known that the best horse in the race, who was a possible distance down if he over raced, was going to have the softest lead possible, they couldn't stop betting it. Well, I that one. Yeah, well, um, there's a lot of questions there in that race the stewards should uh, have a look at. So. I would love to know whether Bo Mertens was right into instructions or whether that was his choice because if he goes forward just under his own steam and sits a couple of lengths off Oak Door, he can't miss a place. Right? Going back to last and the horse over raced, you know, he, 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 so anyway, I mean, you just, you just, if you just look at it, okay, you just look at it, so I'm not, I don't want to get into trouble here, but just, the race looked like a one goal to me, that's what it looked like. Uh, he's saying this place when he pops it. Yeah, the market, the market, that's the winner. The big white cover only ever seen one like that. I only really thought one out of the country happened. So, just to clarify, I'm not saying it was a one goer, I'm saying it looked like a one goer. And stewards need to look into races that have the appearance of a one goer when the market supports that. And jumping in, you've got on everything. 
in the nice possible way, but I would say this question to both of you. The best way I think to learn is to be paranoid, but not be paranoid. Yeah, in other words, to say, what if this was happening? And then ask questions. And then you learn, because as Steve has said, we did this show this time last year. Take away all your conspiracy theories, yeah. take it at face value, but then also, when you have some conspiracy theories, oh, what if this was happening? I don't get the impression students are asking that, what if this was happening question. Because they would, have, they would have said, in a private conversation, I should be looking, you know, some of these issues where things that have happened, they you know, last special and others that the stewards haven't really interrogated, not, not in their reports anyway. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not going to spend much time on this year because I did last year and what did it do me? It did me none. So I'm just going to, whenever they happen, I'm just going to move on and go on to the next race. Because there's no point to, for me getting all worked up about it and complaining when it doesn't change anything. Like, so if I thought me jumping up and down about it was going to have the effect of stewards and the integrity department looking at these things closer, I'd keep doing it, but I don't think it's going to. So I'm just going to change around effect. No, I, don't I, don't I don't know what the James Brown effect is. I feel good. I feel good. <laughs> and when you blow up, we're going to get some more refreshments because it's quite warm here and we'll be back with part two.